Welcome to Bible Study. My name is Sam Nobles. I'm the teaching pastor here at Northside Baptist Church. And today we're in session four of the summer semester of Explore the Bible. As I've told you all this month, uh, we're having special guest ministers join us. And today's no exception. I have a good friend uh, with me today, and he's going to introduce himself. Hey, guys. My name is Lundell Holloway. I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church of Weatherford. And so glad to be with you guys today in this Bible study time. Lindell, today, probably more than any other time, people are seeking words of wisdom and they're seeking counsel concerning on how to navigate life. Right. And if if Google could charge, right, they'd make a fortune for the people that have Googled answers to the questions they have in life. Sure. And there's, there's no end of self-help books. Uh, but we have in the Bible— the source of wisdom, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's the wisdom of God and it's true wisdom. It leads us to him. It emphasizes truth. And that comes into play as we get into chapter 28 of Job. So Job's friends, they had not let up. Not at all. And as I've said for the last couple of, of uh, Bible studies, we are dissecting an argument that right. goes on for 30 plus chapters. Their verdict, Job is guilty. What's your evidence? You're suffering. Right. You must have done something that brought this on. So, but Job's friends are mistaken. God has said numerous times in this book, Job's innocent. He's done nothing. That's right. And Job's friends say, you have to have done something. Job would further say that uh, the explanation of the trial was ultimately hidden as a divine mystery. That if I've done something wrong, it's because God has put me in a place to do something wrong. Right. right? I mean, he, he is really bringing out the sovereignty of God all through this book. Well, Job's friends, finally, they become silent after their final plea, but Job had more to say. And that's what we find here in chapter 28. He's going to reflect on some of the wisdom of God, and he's going to use creation as an analogy to bring out God's wisdom. So in Job chapter 28, we'll start with verse 12. It says, but where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and it's not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not in me, and the sea says, it is not within me. It cannot be bought for gold or silver, cannot be weighed as, as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels or fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral, or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. So Job is asking the question about where wisdom can be found, and then he answers his own questions and tells us where it can't be found, right? right? So when you look at all of these things he mentions, the gold and the glass and the onyx and the sapphire, what do all these items do you see, this, this analogy, what does that have in common? Sure. What do all those things have in common? Well, bottom line here, Job's trying to make the point that wisdom is of great value mm-hmm. and not just of great value, of the greatest value. Right. And in his term, he's saying it's worth pursuing more than jewels or gold. If we were to put that in a modern context, we might say that wisdom is more important than our bank account or our retirement plan. <laughs> you know, that's the thing that we right. need to be pursuing. And what he's also demonstrating here is that in spite of all of man's technological advances and abilities and, um, you know, our own wisdom, which Mm. is certainly different than God's wisdom, uh, we can't find the greatest treasure of all, which is God's wisdom without God's help. Absolutely. And that's what I see in this as well, is, is that no amount of effort, even as vigorous and demanding as mining, right? Right. And to, to get these jewels and to go to all these places, this is a lot of work. And that's not going to yield the wisdom of God, right? right. I mean, and, and we can put that back to us, right? Send back to our bank accounts. No matter how much you fully fund that Roth IRA, right? right. Or, or whatever the case may be, that is not bringing you the wisdom that God wants for you. Well, and what Job, you know, as you said earlier, He's uh, being accused by his friends, and he's saying, well, I've got something to say on this. And as he continues to say, 
it's the sovereignty of God. I can't explain it. I don't know what it is, but right. I, I trust that I know that I've done nothing wrong. Right. And I trust that God is doing something. And so what he's saying here is I'm going to seek God's wisdom in this, not your wisdom. <laughs> well said. Well said. God's wisdom, the, the value can't be found in the world. It can't be bought at any price. It can't be worked for and earned. It has to be given by God. Look at verse 20. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. So Job is saying wisdom is, is hidden, right? It's, it's hidden from the living and the dead. Neither are able to grasp true wisdom, nor either are the source of true wisdom, right? So if, if this wisdom is hidden, Lennon, where's Job going with this? Where do we find it? Well, of course, we get the advantage of being able to see the whole book. Yes. And the whole story. And, of course, we have more than just this book. We have the entirety <laughs> of God's Word where we can go to this. And so Absolutely. bottom line would be the pursuit of wisdom is the pursuit of God. Yes. Because it might be better said this way, when you pursue God, you find wisdom. Yes. And so, um, and something that's, I think, unique to the story of Job, for sure, is wisdom is not just answers or knowledge. It is God himself. That's great. And, uh, you know, a spoiler alert, when you get to the end of the book and, and God shows up, it, it really proves a point. Um, and I, I've had some friends who were grieving before that, that taught me this, but answers only lead to more questions. If we're going through tough times, even if God were to show up and say, well, let me tell you why all this is happening or where all this came from, right. it would only lead us to go, well, why? <laughs> well, why that? Well, yes. why did it have to happen this way? And so really comfort is found in the presence of God. Yes. And so that's why the pursuit of God, not the pursuit of God's wisdom, not the pursuit of God's actions or anything else, it's the pursuit of, of a relationship with God at a personal level that's, that's going to bring uh, comfort, and it's in his presence. And so that's where he's saying, you know, you can't find it on your own in all of these places because it's not here or there. It's it's only found in the presence of God. Yes. It can't, it's not found in the treasures of earth. It's not found with the living or the dead. Uh, he said, the point is, right, this must exist outside of those things. Absolutely. And God is the only one outside of those things. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, preacher, revivalist, uh, I want to read a quote from him. He says, uh, this is indeed at once our confidence and our comfort. God understands. The things that perplex us do not perplex him. The, mystery, the mysteries by which we are surrounded are no mysteries mm. to him. That's right. That, that's what makes him the source of all wisdom. Absolutely. And, and you know, you come back to this this truth, that comfort's found in his presence. There's also a practical application for us. Sometimes when we are wanting to uh, minister to people who are hurting or who are going through a difficult time, you know, you probably hear the same thing I do. I, I don't know what I'm going to say, or I don't know what I'm okay. going to do. And the truth is just be there. Yes. It's, it's the presence that matters, not the words, not the answers, not the anything else. And I think this is you know, like you said, you've got this whole argument that we're looking at where Job's friends <laughs> are are trying to find the answers. Well, why did this happen and what's going on? And I think Job's beginning to turn a corner here to say it, it, the, the question's not why, it's who. Yeah, great point. You know, and that's so true because uh, it wasn't long ago I was ministering to a family. Uh, the guy's wife was in a horrible car accident. And he had already, you know, lost uh, another family member in a car accident. So, I mean, he is in a bad place, sure. or at least seemingly. And I show up at the hospital, and I don't have words to say, mm -mm. right? I just give the guy a hug, and, you know, I, I'm feeling like I have missed the moment, right? But later on, he's like, and you ministered to me so much right. just by being there. And I guarantee he, he has no idea what you said. He just knows you were there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So having shown God as the source of wisdom, now he makes the application towards man, right? Man must look to God for wisdom, 
uh, and may share in it only through a knowledge of the revealed mind of God. Look what, what Job goes on to say, verse 23. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it, he established it and searched it out. So Job says, look, the only God is the true source of wisdom. And that wisdom is seen in God's creative work. He says, right. just look how things work together. Look, look how the rain falls and causes things to grow. Look look how the wind blows the way that it does. And, and he's, he's look at the lightning and the thunder. This is put together by the source of wisdom. This is God himself. So, Lendl, we have the advantage of, of seeing the lightning and the thunder. Right. Last night, we saw hail fall. That's right. Uh, you, we, we see the rain, we see all the, the creation of God, yet we look to other places besides God to try to find our wisdom. Why, why do you think we do that? Well, I think the answer is there's as many answers for that as there are people. <laughs> because <laughs> some people obviously are motivated by wealth or happiness or peace. Others may get a fire lit under them. Uh, because they're in a situation like Job, and they're just seeking relief from pain or comfort right. or these type of things. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off a little different direction maybe here yeah. for, for just a little bit. M- mankind in our sin nature has a natural bent for independence. Yes. And our culture actually even supports this way of thinking. And so to admit that I need God or that I need something beyond me is at times seen as weakness. Hmm. And it's been drilled into our heads from a young age that we should take care of number one, and I've got to be independent. (laughs) But the truth of God's word here, it demonstrates over and over that we've been created for a relationship with God, and we've been put together in a way where we are interdependent on one another. Hmm. Uh, We're not complete alone. And so God gives us himself fully, but he also gives us one another. So if if I need to give it a name, I would say pride and arrogance keep us from seeking the wisdom of God. Yes. And, and honestly, we have to step back and recognize that our culture has probably supported that attitude of pride and arrogance of this idea of a self-made person yes. or you just got to figure out and, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and get through this on your own. But God never intended for us to be this way. And I think pride and arrogance are the, the cloak of many, yeah. many of our sins, right? Uh, yeah, and I think we, we live in this, this age of information and academia, and we have all these experts on all of these things, right? And they have all of this evidence Right, and we right. feel like we have to at least give it a shot. Right? right, we we need to look and see what other people are saying. After after all, they are the experts. That's right. right. Well, and that's a great point, Sam. Because again, Job's friends are looking for answers, and and yes, there is a point where Job himself is is looking for some sort of explanation and answers. But again, we go back to that just underlying theme: answers don't bring the comfort. It's mm. the presence that brings right. the comfort. And if I just go to you know personal illustrations of going, you know, there's a there's a time when when if I'm pursuing the wisdom of God, it's kind of like I just want to be in his presence because I know he's going to take care of things. Um, you know, if if I knew my dad was taking us on a trip somewhere, you know, as a kid, I didn't get in the car and go, hey, where are we going? Where are you doing that? How are you going to drive that that way? Well, where are you going with that? Well, wouldn't you should? It, I just trusted him. Right. Because I trusted him because I knew he loved me. Because I knew he was my dad, and I knew he was taking me somewhere I wanted to go. Right. And I didn't have to worry so much about the details. I just could enjoy the journey um, along the way. And I think that's something that that all of us have a struggle with, mm. of just trusting God along the journey, especially when the journey has some bumps in the road, like we're seeing with Job. And that's an understatement to call it bumps in the road for, <laughs> for Job. Absolutely. Well, let's see how this, this chapter concludes here. Verse 28, uh, and he said, to man, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. So Job's making the announcement. 
wisdom is found in fearing God, right? right. It is found, like you said, the, the comforts in the presence. Wisdom is found in him, being with him, uh, uh, turning to him, right? So how does pursuing godly wisdom, how would that... Well, let me let me throw a curveball in there. Have it. So we have godly wisdom, and we have worldly wisdom. Right. So what are the the, the what's the difference in the two, and and how wh- where do each one of those lead? Well, to me, if you put it simply, worldly wisdom is saying I got to figure out how to get out of this by myself, hmm. and godly wisdom is saying God, I'm going to trust you, even when I even when I don't understand what I'm, I mean. To be honest with you, I say it all the time to my church, following the things of God is not just countercultural at times, it's counterintuitive mm. at times. Love your enemies, pray for those yeah. that persecute you. No, thank you. It's the upside down you, you kingdom, know, it, right? It's, it's, it's not something that you're going to do just on your own. It's something that you're going to have to intentionally pursue. And so I think in, in this, what Job's really coming to is— Again, this idea that it's the pursuit of God that will lead you to find wisdom. But we also know it won't just lead you to find wisdom. It'll lead you to find love and joy and peace and patience and kindness (laughs) and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and other fruits of the Spirit as well. But here's the kicker for us. We have to get out of that box of pursuing God as just a checkbox of moral decisions. Well, I read my Bible point. and I went to church and great and I and I did all this thing. It, we have to learn to see that my relationship with God is not part of life. My relationship with God is is life. life. Yes, yes. And Job exemplified that God alone is enough. He didn't, you know, in his misery, we're told he did not sin. He pursued. Hmm. He didn't just sit idly by and go, "Well, I guess God's doing something." Right. No, he was pursuing, but he didn't blame God. He trusted God in the midst of it. And that's the same thing that we have to do. If we're going through difficulties of struggles, we need to learn at those point in times to pursue God Hmm. and, and to trust him in the journey and to see example over and over and over in scripture of how you would go, well, I wouldn't have done it that way, but we (laughs) see how God's hand has been on it. Should allow us to just trust God on the journey. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you look at worldly wisdom, godly wisdom, sometimes they seem to run parallel. Sometimes. Right? But then there are crucial moments where, like you say, last is first and first is last. Those will those who want to find life will lose, lose it. Absolutely. The, the weak become strong. Right. And so it's, it veers away from worldly wisdom because worldly wisdom only leads to the end of self. That's right. Where godly wisdom leads us to be more like God, be more like his son, right? right? Be informed into that image. Uh, So the Bible doesn't condemn all wisdom, right? but it does say there's severe consequences for being carried away by worldly wisdom, right? Even Paul would tell the Ephesians, don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that blows around, right? right? All of this modern worldly wisdom sounds great. You've got evidence and you have experts and you have data and analysis, and surely this has to say something. But there are those times where, where we need to remember we're, we are part of a different, we're citizens of a different kingdom. Right. The one that, that seems upside down to everybody else, right? right. We, we are part of that. And it's going to make our lives maybe look odd at some times because of the choices that we make. Right. But is based off the wisdom of God. And that leads us to being more in the image of his son. Well, and I would even say that some, in some way you could say that the the worldly wisdom is really just simply knowledge. And it's knowledge based on experience Hmm. and research that we're able to do, uh, which quickly leads me to a place to go, okay, who has more experience, me or God? (laughs) And so if God's saying I should do something in a way that I might not be able to see all the details or even explain, I should be able to trust in who he is as opposed to just the limited evidence that I can see from my perspective. Another spoiler alert, Job will get that chance. He will, (laughs) yeah. And he will end up with more questions than answers. That's exactly right. For sure. As a matter of fact, in the book, he doesn't get a single question answered. (laughs) Not, Not one. But yet he gets to a place where he goes, I'm good because you're here. So good. 
Good point, man. Little thank you for being here and doing hey, Bible thanks, study. Appreciate with me. you asking me. Uh, would you mind closing us out with a word of prayer? Let me do that. God, you are so good, and it is just incredible to be able to say that, even as we look at a a book that brings a lot of questions to mind and a lot of uh, scenarios where we go, man, I don't know that I completely understand that. But what we do know is that you are good and that your presence brings comfort and that you desire so much to have a relationship with us that you've taken every hindrance out of the way for that to happen. And you've provided a path straight to you because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so, God, I pray that we would trust in you more than we would trust in your work I pray that we would trust in you more than we would trust in our experience and that we would pursue you so that we can find wisdom and life and everything else that we need because it comes from you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us for Bible study. I hope you'll join us again next time.